Hey everyone, my name's Trevor, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to create a dialogue system with choices for a 2D game in Unity. By the end of this video, we'll have created a system where the player can walk up to an NPC and then talk to them by pressing a button. The system will be able to support any number of choices, and it'll also be easy to add other NPCs. While the example in this tutorial is set up for a Metroidvania or platformer styled game, the exact same logic will apply to most other 2D game genres including top-down games and even many 3D games with some minor adjustments. And of course, you can find the end result of what we're going to create, as well as the starting point if you want to follow along, on GitHub, which I'll put a link to in the description of this video. Before we jump into Unity and start creating this, let's take a look at what we're going to be doing and how this dialogue system is going to be structured. We'll be using something called Ink to create the actual dialogue. Ink is a scripting language for writing dialogue that integrates quite nicely with Unity, and it even comes with its own custom editor called Inky. How it works is that we're going to write our dialogue logic including things such as making choices using Ink. We'll then save that Ink file into our Unity project, and Unity will automatically compile that into a JSON file, which is just a data representation of the dialogue we wrote. Then, in a c -sharp script, we can turn that JSON file into what's called a story object, which gives us an easy and intuitive way to traverse through our dialogue's flow. The main benefit to using Ink for writing our dialogue is that we can keep our dialogue's logic, such as making choices, mostly separate from our actual dialogue system we're going to be creating. We're going to keep the dialogue we write pretty simple for this tutorial, but I do have an entire video on how to write dialogue using ink, which I'll put in the description of this video if you're interested in digging deeper. So that's how ink works, but now let's go over how our dialogue system is going to work and we'll see how ink fits into it. First off, we'll have a Unity scene with a player and an NPC. The NPC will have a specific ink JSON file attached to them for the dialogue flow they're going to display when they're talked to. They'll also have a box collider on them that acts as a trigger to detect whether or not the player is in range of talking to them. If the player is within range, we'll show a visual cue that tells the player that they can press a button to interact with the NPC. Once the player presses that button, we'll send off the ink JSON file for that NPC using a c -sharp script to something we'll call the dialogue manager. The dialogue manager will be a singleton class, meaning that there can only be one of them in the project. The dialogue manager will take that ink JSON file, turn it into a story object that we can more easily work with, and then display a dialogue panel with the first line of dialogue from that story. We'll also use the dialogue manager to keep track of whether or not the dialogue is currently playing. Other scripts can then reference that information and behave accordingly. For example, our player controller script will use that information to freeze the player's movement if dialogue is playing. After we've clicked through all of the dialogue for that NPC, the dialogue manager will hide the dialogue panel and then exit the dialogue mode, allowing the player to move again. As you can imagine, there are a lot of ways to architect this, each with their own pros and cons. As I just described, we'll be using a singleton pattern in this tutorial, However, something like an event-driven system would also work quite well if you're familiar with those concepts. If you're not though, don't worry since we're not going to be doing that in this video. It's also important to note that with this setup, I'm assuming that each NPC will have their own ink dialogue file. For organizational purposes, I think this makes the most sense for the majority of 2D games. Although it's important to note that if you're planning on putting all of your dialogue in a single ink file, which may make more sense for some narrative-driven games, there are likely better ways to architect your dialogue system than what I just described. Alright, enough talking. Let's jump into Unity and put all this into action. I've set up a few things ahead of time to help us get started. I created a couple icons we're going to use which are in the project's art directory. Then in the scene I have a main camera, which the only thing I've changed here is the background color. There's also some ground, which is just a square sprite that's stretched across the x-axis with a box collider 2D and rigid body of type static so that the player collides with it. Of course, there's also a player, which is just a square sprite with a box collider 2D and dynamic rigid body to handle collisions. The player also has a very simple character controller 2D script that will let us move around horizontally and jump. It's also important to note that I've given the player the player tag, which will be important later in this tutorial. And last, I have this manager's game object, which has a child game object called input manager. 
I'll be using Unity's new player input system along with this custom script to make things a bit easier for this tutorial. If you're unfamiliar with Unity's new player input system, all you really need to know for this tutorial is that when I press a button, for example the jump button, it's going to map to a function in my input manager script. The input manager script is a singleton class that's simply keeping track of if a button was pressed, so that way I can more easily reference that information in other scripts across the project. If we look at the input action asset, I already have input actions set up for jump, move, interact, and submit. We'll also be using something called TextMesh Pro in this tutorial, which is just a more flexible way of creating text in Unity that's become somewhat of an industry standard. It can be installed by going to Window, Package Manager, make sure Unity Registry is selected from this dropdown, and then search for TextMesh Pro. Hit Install, and then once installed, go to Window, TextMesh Pro, import TMP Essential Resources, then click Import again, and once this finishes, you should see a TextMesh Pro folder show up in your Assets directory. Of course, we'll need to install the Ink Unity plugin as well. You can find this on the Unity Assets Store, which I'll put a link to in the description of this video. Once you've added the asset to your account, you can go to Window, Package Manager, select My Assets from this dropdown, and then you should see Ink Unity Integration as one of the options. Select it and then click Import. You can deselect demos if you want to, but I'm going to leave it selected, and then hit Import again. You should see a folder called Ink show up in your project assets after the import completes. You'll also likely want the custom editor for Ink called Inky. This can be downloaded from Inkle Studio's website, which I'll also put a link to in the description of this video. Finally, just to make sure everything is set up properly, let's create a dialog folder. And in that folder, I'll right click, create ink, which will create a new ink file. We'll just call this one test. And then if you have Ink's custom editor installed, you should be able to double click it to open it up in the Inky editor. We'll just write some plain text in this file and save it. Then back in Unity, we can click on the compiled JSON file and in our inspector, we should see some data that looks like this. You'll notice that we can see the two lines that we added as part of the data. And if we switch to selecting the ink file, we actually get a nice editor where we could play through the dialogue. If you're missing the compiled JSON file or the data just looks off, you can right click on the ink file and then select recompile ink, which should hopefully fix the issue. If you get this far, it's safe to assume that everything is working as intended. And just to note, if you download this project from GitHub and use the starting point branch, all of this should be set up to this point in the video. Now that we're all set up, let's create an NPC to talk to. In the scene, we'll create a new empty game object called NPC. Then we'll create a child object that's going to be a 2D object, sprites, square, and then we'll call this one visual. This will represent the visual for our NPC. We'll go ahead and change the scale of the visual just a bit, and we'll also change the color to a yellow color. Then we'll create another empty game object under the NPC and call it trigger. This object is going to handle detecting our player and triggering the dialog UI. We'll put a box collider 2D on this one and make sure the trigger checkbox is checked, and then we'll change the scale of the box collider to be a bit bigger than the visual. Last, we're going to create one more 2D sprite object underneath the NPC object and we'll call this one Visual Q. We'll position this right above the NPC visual. For the sprite, we're just going to use this icon that I made ahead of time. We'll make the icon a bit smaller and then I'll move the entire NPC down to match the ground. That's good for the NPC, but now we need to write a script to handle showing the visual cue as well as starting the dialogue with an ink file when the user presses a button. To keep things organized, let's create a new folder in our scripts folder and call it dialog. Next, let's create a new C -sharp script and call it dialog trigger. Then double click it to open it up in your code editor. First, let's get rid of these placeholder start and update methods. Taking this one step at a time, let's first focus on making the visual cue show up only when the player is in bounds of the box collider. We'll first create a game object variable for the visual cue and use serialize field so that way it shows up in the inspector. Then let's create an awake method and we'll initialize the visual cue to be inactive at the start of the game, which will make it hidden. We'll also need to keep track of if the player is in range, so let's create a boolean called player in range to keep track of this. We'll add that to our awake method and then initialize it as false. 
We can use these built-in Unity functions called onTriggerEnter2D and onTriggerExit2D to detect when another collider enters or exits the collider of the game object that this script is attached to. Now this will detect any other collider, which includes the ground, meaning that we need to make sure that the other collider belongs to the player. Because we have the player tagged as player in the Unity inspector, we can check the tag of the incoming collider to make sure it's the player. From there, when the player enters, we set player and range to be true, and when they exit, we set player and range to be false. Then in the update method, we can add a simple if statement on whether or not to show the visual cue. If the player is in range, we'll set it to be active to show it, otherwise we'll set it to be inactive to hide it. Last, if we're in range, we also want to listen for if the player presses the interact button. If they do, we're going to eventually call the dialog manager with the appropriate ink JSON file. Of course, we haven't created the dialog manager yet, but we can get things stubbed out for right now. Let's create a serialize field for the ink JSON, which is going to be of type text asset. Then in our update method under the case where the player is in range, we'll check for if the player has pressed the interact button. Eventually we'll have a call to a method in our dialog manager, but for now we'll just print out the ink JSON text to make sure this is working. Now back in Unity, we'll drag this new script onto the trigger game object that we created under the NPC. For the visual queue slot, we'll drag in our visual queue object, and finally, for the ink JSON, for now, we'll drag in the JSON data from the test ink file that we created during the setup part of this tutorial. Now, if we hit play, you can see that the visual cue only shows up when the player is near the NPC. And if I click the I button to interact with the NPC, we can see that our JSON data file is being printed out, which is exactly what we want. Next, we need to create a dialog panel to display our dialog. In the scene hierarchy, we'll right-click, UI, Canvas, which will create a new canvas and event system. Click on the canvas, and then under the Canvas Scalar component, select Scale with Screen Size for the UI Scale Mode. This will make it so that our UI objects scale with the screen size. Then right-click on the canvas, go to UI, and then Panel to create a new panel. We'll call this Dialog Panel. Then we'll resize it a bit and then position it so that it's at the top of the screen. To do so, we can click on this box here and then hold Alt and Shift and then click on the top center option. This will move and anchor the panel to the top center. I'm going to round off the width and height to be 750 by 150. Then we'll change the Y position to negative 10 to give it a little bit of space from the top. Next, we'll right click on the dialog panel and then go to UI Text Text Mesh Pro to create some text. We'll call this dialog text and change the font size to 32 and then make sure the alignment is horizontally to the left and then vertically to the top. We'll then position this to the top left of the panel. A position X of 20, position Y of negative 20, and then a width of 200 and height of 50 seem to be just fine. And we'll also need to drag out this yellow border to fill the panel. Then for one final touch, we're going to right click on the dialog panel, go to UI and then image, and then we'll name this one continue icon. We'll change the image to one that I made ahead of time called continue icon. Then we'll change the size to be a width and height of 25, anchor the position to the bottom center, and then give it a position Y of 15. That will do for the first cut of the dialog panel, but one last thing. If you're using Unity's new input system like I am, you'll need to click on the event system game object and then click this replace with input system UI input module button. We'll come back to this later to configure it, but if you don't do this now, you'll get an error later when we try to play the project. So next, let's create the dialog manager script, which will manage and display the dialog that's written to the UI we just created. In the scripts dialog folder, we'll create a new C -sharp script and call it dialog manager. Then double click it to open it up. As I mentioned before, this will be a singleton class, so let's set that up. We'll create a static instance of the dialog manager. Then in the awake method, we'll initialize that instance. And last, we'll create a public static get instance method that will return that instance. One other thing that's good to do when creating a singleton class is to give ourselves a warning or error if there's ever more than one of these in the scene, since by design that should never happen. 
So I'll add a warning log if we tried to initialize it when the instance has already been created. Next, let's create a few variables that we're going to need. We're going to need access to the dialog panel so that way we can hide or show it depending on if dialog is plain. So I'll add a serialize field game object for that. We'll also need access to the dialog text so we can set it according to the ink file contents we want to display. This will be of type text mesh pro u GUI, which to use, we'll need to declare that we're using tm pro in our using statements. We'll also need to keep track of the current ink file to display. We can do this in a private variable of type story called current story. To use the story type, we'll need to add another using statement to our file called ink.runtime. And finally, we'll also want to keep track of whether or not the dialog is currently plain. So for now, I'll create a private boolean called dialog is plain. Then let's create a start method and make sure dialog is plain initializes to false. And we'll also make sure to set the dialog panel to be inactive. Now let's create a method to enter dialog mode, which we can call from our trigger dialog script. It'll be a public method that takes in a text asset, which is our ink.json file. The first thing we need to do is set the current story of the dialog manager to a new story that's initialized using the ink.json text that's passed in. Then we should set dialog is plain to be true, and then set the dialog panel to be active so it's shown. Now we need to display the first line of our dialog, we can see if there's dialog to be played by accessing the boolean can continue for our current story. If there is, we'll set the dialog text dot text to equal current story dot continue. The continue method not only gives us the next line of dialog, but you can kind of think of it like it's popping that line off of a stack. As such, next time we call current story dot continue, it'll give us the next line of dialog and so on. Of course, we should handle if the story can't continue, which ultimately means that an empty ink JSON file was passed in. In that case, we'll call a method that we're going to create called exit dialog mode. We'll then create a private method for this called exit dialog mode. When we exit, we should set the dialog is plain to be false, and then set the panel to be inactive again so that way it no longer shows. And we'll also reset the dialog text.text .text to an empty string for good measure. Next, let's finish this off by creating an update method to handle traversing the logic of the ink story. First off, if dialog isn't playing at all, we'll return right away, since we only want to update when dialog is playing. Otherwise, we'll check for player input on if they've pressed the submit button. Now what we need to do here is actually the exact same as what we did in the enter dialog mode method. I'm going to create a new method called continue story, and then we'll move this chunk of code in enter dialog mode into continue story. Now I can call continue story in enter dialog mode as well as in the update method when the player presses the submit button. And that should be it for the first cut of the dialog manager. Now let's hop back into Unity and see if this works. Under my manager's game object, I'm going to create an empty game object and call it dialog manager. Then I'll drag the dialog manager script onto it. Next, we just need to drag the dialog panel and dialog text into the appropriate slots. And finally, we need to hook up our trigger script to the dialog manager so we can actually see this work. In the scripts dialog folder, I'll double click on the dialog trigger script to open it up. All we need to do here is switch out this line where we're printing out the ink JSON with a call to the dialog manager. So I'll replace this with dialog manager .get instance .enter dialog mode and then pass in the ink JSON text asset variable. Now let's go back into Unity and hit play. We'll see that if I'm near the NPC and I hit the I button to interact, a dialog panel is displayed with the text from our test ink file that we wrote earlier. You'll notice a few things though. First, the player can still move around, and second, if we click I again while the dialog is playing, it just resets back to the first line. So let's fix those things real quick. Back in the dialog manager script, I'm going to change dialog is playing to be public. Then I'll add this little bit after the variable, which makes it read only to outside scripts. This is because I only want outside scripts to be able to read the value and not be able to modify it. And just a quick note, you could also do this for the instance variable if you wanted to, which would allow you to get rid of the get instance method. 
Then we'll open the character controller 2D script that's handling all of the player movement. In this character controller, all of the movement happens in fixed update. So the easiest way for me to freeze the player is to check if dialogue is playing and then return if it is. Obviously, depending on your player controller script, freezing the player movement may be a bit different or more involved. Next, I'll switch over to the dialogue trigger script. In the update method, I'm going to modify this to say if the player is in range, and dialogue is not playing. Now, if dialogue is playing, the visual cue will become inactive and we also won't be able to trigger dialogue again until the current dialogue has finished. If we hit play with these changes, we can now see that when we talk to the NPC, the player is frozen, and we also can't restart the dialogue midway by pressing the interact button again. But there's still one last thing that we need to fix. You probably noticed that when the dialogue finishes, the player jumps. In our case, this is because the jump button and the submit button are both the spacebar, which is pretty common in Metroidvania and platformer style games. And we're unfreezing the player at the same time we're doing the final submission, so both input actions fire off at the same time. We can fix this by waiting a short amount of time before exiting the dialogue. Back in the dialogue manager script, we'll scroll down to the exit dialogue mode method, and we're going to turn this into a coroutine. First, we'll change the return type to an I enumerator. Then we'll add this line that says yield return new wait for seconds 0.2F. This line tells our script to wait for 0.2 seconds before continuing. Last, anytime we call this method, which in our case is just once in the continue story method, we need to call it like this, where we put the function call inside of a start coroutine call. Now, if we play this again, we can see that after the dialogue finishes, the player no longer jumps. Now that our dialogue system is working for lines of dialogue, let's do something more interesting and add the functionality for the player to make choices. Under the dialogue panel, we're going to make a new empty game object called Dialogue Choices. Right click on Dialogue Choices and go to UI, Button, Text Mesh Pro, and call it Choice Zero. This creates a button as well as a child object, which is our Text Mesh Pro text. Let's click on the text object and change the font size to 18 and make sure the alignment is horizontally to the left and vertically centered. We'll also change the text color to white to match the dialog panel text. Then on the button, we'll change the normal color to have a transparency of zero, and the selected color to be a bit darker. Then we'll position the dialog choice's parent object to be on the far left and directly below the dialog panel. Next, we'll select choice zero in the scene hierarchy and then use the shortcut Control D to duplicate it. We'll call the new one choice one. Then we'll position choice one to be a bit below choice zero in the scene. To navigate through these choices, we're going to use Unity's built-in event system. Just to note, if you're not using Unity's new input system, what I'm about to do is going to look slightly different. We'll click on the event system game object in the scene, then under action asset, select the input action asset that contains your control scheme that you'll be using for the UI. In my case, it's called controls, which I showed briefly during the project setup portion of this video. How it automatically filled out is exactly what I'm looking for, which is that to move, it's going to use the same controls the player uses to move, and to select a choice, it's going to use the submit button. We'll also uncheck the deselect on background checkbox. And now let's move back into the dialog manager script and add some code to support making choices. We'll create a section for the choices UI and we'll add a game object array called choices. This will allow us to have any number of choices as long as it's supported by the UI. We'll also add a text mesh pro U GUI array and call it choices text, which we'll use to keep track of the text for each choice. In our start method, we'll initialize choices text to be an array of the same length as our choices. Then for each choice in the choices array, we'll initialize the corresponding text using an index for that choice so that they match. We can get the choices text through the get component in children method since the text is a child object for each choice. And don't forget to increment our index after each iteration of the loop. Now we need to display the choices appropriately based on the ink story. Let's create a new method called display choices. First, we'll get the list of choices, if there are any, from our current story. We can do this by calling current choices on our current story, which will return a list of choice objects. 
Next, we should do a bit of a defensive programming check and just make sure our current UI can actually support the amount of choices that are coming in. If there are more current choices than in our choices array, which represents how many choices our UI can support, we'll log an error. This next part can be a bit tricky, but we need to loop through all of our choice game objects in the UI and display them according to the current choices from the ink story. We'll start by declaring an integer index and setting it equal to zero. Then we'll loop through and enable the choice objects in our UI up to the amount of current choices from the ink story. For each choice in current choices, we'll set our choice UI game object for that index to be active and also set the UI text to be equal to the choice text. And then of course, increment our index. That loop will put our UI and the current choices in sync, but we might have leftover choices in our UI that we need to hide. In a for loop, we'll initialize an integer i as the index we left off on in the previous loop. Then we'll loop while i is less than the number of choices our UI can support. And of course, we'll increment i after each iteration. Then inside this loop, we'll set any other choices that are in our UI to be inactive. And of course, we actually need to call the display choices method that we just created. We can do that right in our continue story method right after we've set the text for the dialog line. Now back in Unity, if I go to the dialog manager in the scene hierarchy, I can add on to our choices array and drag in the choice buttons from the UI. I'm also actually going to create one more choice so that we have three choices in total. Also, the test ink file that we've been using doesn't have any choices. Let's create a new ink file, call it Pokemon, and then open it up in the Inky editor by double clicking it. I'm going to paste in an example where we're prompted to choose a Pokemon and then at the end we get some text telling us what we chose. If you're interested in how this syntax works, I have another video where I go over this in great detail, which I'll put a link to in the description of this video. Be sure to save this and then in our NPC trigger game object, let's drag in the Pokemon JSON file as the ink JSON to replace the test one. If we play this, we'll notice that we actually can't select any of our choices. This is because in Unity's event system, we need to define a first selected choice. Back in the dialog manager script, let's add a using statement for Unity's event systems. Then it's kind of strange how we need to go about doing this. Perhaps in the future, there will be a better way to do this, but for right now, the best way that I could find was by setting the first selected choice using a coroutine. So let's create that real quick. First, we'll create a private method with an I enumerator return type called select first choice. In it, we need to first set the event system's current game object to be null. Then we have to wait for the end of the frame. And finally, we can set the new selected game object, which in this case will always be our first choice game object. Again, from what I could gather, Unity's event system requires it to be cleared first and then have the selected object be set in a different frame. But if you know a better way to do this, be sure to let me know in the comments for this video. Finally, we can call this coroutine at the end of our display choices method. If we go back into play mode, we can now select the choice using the arrow keys. But you'll notice this time that when we select the choice, it actually ends the dialog instead of continuing on. This is because we need to inform our story object that a choice was selected. Back in the dialog manager script, we'll add a public method called make choice, which is going to take in an integer called choice index. Then to inform our story of which choice we've selected, we can do current story dot choose choice index and then pass in the choice index. Back in the unity inspector, for each of our choice buttons, we can simply add an on click method. Then we can drag in the dialog manager and then select the make choice function that we just created. For choice 0, the choice index will be 0, for choice 1, it'll be 1, and so on. If we go back into play mode, we'll see that the dialog system is functioning just like we'd want it to with choices. And that's it for the dialog system. The last thing I'll show is how easy it is to add new NPCs with this setup. We'll create a new folder called prefabs and then drag in the NPC game object to create a prefab. Of course, we'll zero out its positional values for the prefab, then I'll drag the NPC prefab back into the scene, position it, change its color, and then switch out the ink JSON file to our test file from before. Now if we go back into play mode, we've got a new NPC with different dialogue. And that's it.
Thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up so more people see it. And if you want to see more from me, be sure to hit the subscribe button as well. I know this was a long video, so if you made it to the end, I just wanted to say thanks again. Have an excellent day, and I hope this was helpful.